Well, welcome to the second event of the Iranian music series. Before we begin, I would like to thank the Farhang Foundation for the generous support of the Iranian music program at UCLA. I'm also thankful for the support I have received from uh, Dean Strempel and her amazing team, especially Liz uh, Wuhev Team, <laughs> for organizing these three events with me. Um, now I would like to introduce our panelist, Professor Reza Wali. Um, he was born in 1952. He began his music studies at the Conservatory of Music in Tehran in 1972. He went to Austria and studied music education and composition at the Academy of Music in Vienna. After graduating from the Academy of Music, he moved to United States and continued his study at the University of Pittsburgh, receiving his PhD in music theory and composition in 1985. Mr. Wally has been faculty member of the School of Music at Carnegie Mellon University since 1988. He has been received numerous honors and commission, including honor prize of the Austria Ministry of Art and uh, science, two Andrew Mellon Fellowship commissions from the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Modern Orchestra Project, the Boston New Music Ensemble, Kronos Quartet, and many more. He has been recorded on Dolce Gramophone, Naxos, New Albion, MMC, Ambassador, Albany, and ABC Classic Label. His most recent book, Return to the Origins, Technique of Musical Language, was published in both Persian and English last year. This book holds a great relevance to our discussion today. Our another uh, panelist, Erberg, um, Erberg Erilmaz. Turkish-American composer and performer Erbik Elimaz is recognized for bringing the energy for the folk music of his homeland to the concert stage with creative and dramatic approach. His recent album of chamber works, Dance of Yogurt Maker, won a Grammy Award with producer Judith Sherman and received two gold medals at Global Music Award in 2022. His composition have been performed at some of the world's most important concert venues such as Carnegie Hall, Sydney Opera House, the National Museum of Art in Havana, uh, Cuba, and Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Elimos was selected to participate in the Moon Arts Project, which will include his work, Was Her Face, uh, the moon or sunlight expected to be sent to the moon in 2022. This project will um, bring the first music to the moon and the work received its premiere at NASA uh, next to Saturn V, his story largest rocket. His composition and performances have been featured multiple times on Turkish state radio uh, and American public media's um, performance today and have received prizes um, by Fanfare Magazine, Andante, CNN Torque, uh, Hurriyet, and many others. Okay, um, approaching composition from a non-Eurocentric per perspective. Non-Eurocentric composition refers to musical composition that are created outside of tradition, Western European classical music framework. It is a composition that does not adhere to or draw primary from Western European classical music tradition. It uh, encompasses, but not limited to African, Asian, Middle Eastern, uh, or Latin American musical style. Non-Eurocentric composition emphasized the inclusion and exploration of alternative musical um, approaches 
cultural perspective and unique sonic qualities beyond traditional Western canon. It often incorporates instrument, scale, rhythm, form, and melodic structure that are not characteristic of a, sp a specific cultural tradition. It aims to challenge Eurocentric bases and expand the representation and recognition of diverse musical voice and tradition. This marks the inaugural lecture of ongoing series title Approaching Composition from a Non-Eurocentric Perspective. We are excited to commence this series and look forward to inviting scholars and composers from diverse musical tradition to share the unique perspective on this subject. Our aim is to foster meaningful discussion that explores the rich and varied approaches to the composition beyond the Eurocentric framework. Now I would like to ask Dr. Wally to start his uh, talk. Thank you so much. Um, uh, in order to save time, because we have only, each of us have 20 minutes, so I wrote what I wanted to, to say because it really saves time. So it will be like a conference. I hope you don't mind my reading. Like you're, imagine you're going to a musicology conference and somebody's just reading. And um, that's uh, the first thing. Uh, just as Schaub said, this is a uh, second chapter of my book, Return to the Origins, uh, which was published in, in Tehran a year ago. And the uh, English translation was published actually in November. And it's available uh, online on <coughs> in Amazon. While I'm talking, I will ask uh, Shaw to find the link sure. and just have the link. You can do a snapshot on it. Uh, it's available in, uh, in Amazon. And also I wrote an article uh, which is also was published in uh, the uh, I Care If You Listen magazine of, um, of the American Composers Forum. And that link of that article is also available. I send it to Shaw, hopefully he will uh, pull it up. And, um, and also I just wanna say, because that's the disclaimer that it was in my book, anything I say is my own opinion. I'm not <laughs> affiliated with any group, any organization, anything I say uh, is my own opinion. And uh, basically also I am open also for uh, discourse, uh, basically. So with that, uh, I'm just going uh, to start. Uh, this chapter in my, in my book called uh, two, two Thoughts, and I'm going to start reading it. <clears throat> the cultures of the world, like the oceans, are all interconnected. Every culture bear, bear traces of other traditions and heritages, and no single culture can or should claim to be superior to another culture. Some European civilizations, however, amassed enough economic and military might to conquer significant tracts of the earth beginning in the 16th century. <coughs> By the time the 19th century rolled around, European countries occupied nearly the entire planet. Take Britain, for example. It is a country half the size of Iran. And yet the English occupied about 25% of the land mass of the earth during the 1800s, giving rise to the saying, the sun does not set in the British Empire. <coughs> To justify their colonialism, some European countries th theorize that European culture is a superculture and that European humans were more advanced than Asian and African humans. This theory is the core of what is known as Eurocentrism. Numerous books and articles have been written about the political, social, and cultural aspects of Eurocentrism. Just give you some example, the writings 
of <coughs> Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Edward Said, his famous book called Ori Orientalism. So in social science, they, they are really far advanced. But there has, but there has been far less discussion of the artistic and musical implication of this issue. Here, I will illustrate some of the traces of Eurocentric thinking on music. One, exportation and internationalization of European 12-tone equal temperament tuning system, or 12-TET. The 12-tone equ uh, equal temperament system originated in the early 18th century as European polyphony morphed from horizontal polyphony or polyphony based on the movement of individual voices to vertical polyphony, polyphony based on chord progression. 12-tone equal temperament provides a framework that allows the easier chor chordal movements and transposition between musical keys. Except for the standard interval of octave equivalent to 1200 cents, where cents are logarithmic units of measurement for pitch intervals. None of the 12-tone equal temperament intervals quite correspond to the natural occurring tuning systems based on the physical properties of sound waves, which involve uh, frequencies called harmonics. Many cultures base their music on the natural tuning system, including Asian cultures such as the Far East, India, Iran, the Middle East, and so on. During the last two centuries, however, 12-tone equal temperament has proliferated all over the world and is now being taught in the most art institute such as conservatories and musical schools, music schools. 12-tone equal temperament is also the tuning base for the various genres of global music industry, especially pop and rock and roll music. These genres permeate almost all radio, television, and internet social networks. Due to its prevalence in both academia and the global music industry, this over-reliance of 12-tone equal temperament has created an environment where people around the world are forgetting their own culture's tuning system and musical intervals. Two, exportation and internationalization of European style music education, the so-called conservatory system. Through Europe, the conservatory system is the primary method of reaching, of teaching music. This system's roots uh, stretch back to the French Revolution and the establishment of National Conservatory of Music in Paris. In this system, the best musicians and composers are selected through strict entrance exams and educated through a highly disciplined system that includes the, the reaching, I'm sorry, the teaching of solfege, music dictation, figured bass, harmony, counterpoint, etc. During the 19th century, the con conservatory system evolved and spread to all European countries, and it has since continued to proliferate almost all over the world. This has created several noteworthy problems. First, the cultures of the world, including those of China, India, Iran, East Asia, the Middle East, Africa, already have indigenous method, methods of teaching music and have evolved, uh, which has evolved within those cultures and are educationally close to the music of those cultures. Many of these music education systems are simply not compatible with the European conservatory system and are being erased. 
Second, during the transfer of European conservatory system to other countries, this highly disciplined system has been corrupted and many of its rule has been relaxed and watered down. In many countries, the entrance exam is no longer very difficult or there are no entrance exams. And regular conservatory courses have been either changed or eliminated. The result of such issues is that every year a large group of mus uh, music students graduate from conservatories in non-European countries without a deep understanding of European art music and not knowing the music of their own cultures. Three, division of music into European and non-European music. European art music is often referred as classical music and non-European music is called indigenous or ethnic music. Recently, the name of ethnic music has been changed to world music. In other words, if a performer plays music of Bach, Mozart, or Beethoven, she, he, is performing classical music. But if a performer plays the music of Ravi Shankar or Hossein Ali Zadeh, she, he, is performing ethnic music or world music. Aren't European countries part of the world? Why is only the music of Asia, Africa, and Latin America called world music? Isn't European music part of the music of the world? Fourth, division of music research into musicology and ethnomusicology. If a researcher studies European art music, such as music of Bach or Beethoven or Brahms, that researcher is called a musicologist. But if a re scholar researches Indian or Iranian music, she or he is called an ethnomusicologist. Aren't Germans, French, and Italians ethnic group? Of course they are. A scholar who is researching the music of Bach, she or he is studying the music of ethnic Germans in a historical period, the 18th century. Therefore, she or he is also an ethnomusicologist. Interpretation five. Interpretation and analysis of basic elements of music from a European perspective. Musicians and scholars often examine the structural elements of music, polyphony and monophony, form, rhythm, etc., from a European perspective, rather than in the context of their own historical development and significance. So what is the alternative to Eurocentric thinking? Pluralism, also known as multiculturalism, is a state when cultural diversity is valued over any single culture's alleged superiority. It is the opposite of Eurocentrism, as the value of each individual culture is the same. Rather than studying the fundamental elements of music from a singular European perspective, pluralist thinking suggests that these elements should be analyzed and examined from broader perspectives, like that of, of the scientific or humanitarian with an eye for appreciating cultural diversity. With the rapid advancement of acoustic, psychoacoustic, and cognitive sciences, these fundamental elements of music are currently undergoing critical examination. Therefore, we must not inspect these elements from a particular and limited view, but embrace the more comprehensive approach. I will consider once more the issues I raised above. Twelfth on equal temperament tuning. After World War II, especially in the United States, some American composers 
rebelled against the 12 tone equal temperament. American composers such as Harry Porch and Ben Johnston, both from California, rejected this system in favor of employing natural tuning systems in their compositions. In recent decades, there has been a surge of interest around the world in returning to natural tuning systems and building music based on this system. This trend is occurring in popular music as well, with some commercial musicians adopting some of the intervals and rhythms and instru instruments of different cultures. Turkish musicians, for example, have begun to use asymmetrical rhythms, Turkish music intervals, and Turkish musical instruments in popular music. This process is continuing in Iran as well, something I see as a very positive trend. Teaching music in European style or conservatory teaching. In some respects, in some respect, learning music is synthetically similar to learning a language. Some children grow up learning more than one language, and sometimes a student learn two or more additional languages. As learning multiple languages at the same time isn't impossible. Suppose, for the sake of argument, you decide to study English and Persian at the same time. You would not learn Persian using English grammar and English, uh, uh, and English using Persian grammar. You will use Persian grammar for Persian and English grammar for uh, English. Still, if you studied these languages together, you would also notice a series of English and Persian words that are phonetically nearly identical. For example, the Persian word pass is the same in English, pass. And the Persian word dochter is daughter in English. Where do these similarities come from? Persian and English are in the same lexiconic family and are both in the European languages. When the relationships between these languages are acknowledged, the process of learning them in parallel is better facilitated. This learning process can hold true in music as well. I call this process parallel interconnected education or PI. In parallel interconnected education, students learn two or more musical languages simultaneously. And Similarities between the two musical languages can be used to facilitate learning. For example, suppose a student wanted to learn European music as well as Iranian music. He or she could learn European music using the European music tradition, which is the conservatory system, and Iranian music using the Iranian music tradition, the Radif system, in parallel. In many countries, the students attending conservatories learn European music by default due to a historically Eurocentric presupposition of the dominance of European music. A better, more pluralist, pluralistic route would be to ask the student what sort of music he or she wishes to study and teach this in parallel with other musical languages. Of course, with the advancement of technology, the students can now communicate with various professors and experts in various styles 
and cultures of music via the internet. In this way, concert conservatory style teaching is used to teach European music and the music of other cultures will be taught according to the musical traditions of those cultures. Division of music into European and non-European music. In pluralistic thinking, music is not divided into European and non-European music. Classical music refers not to a specific historical period or culture's music, but to the art music of a country. The music of all countries could be divided into classical or art music of that country, folk music, religious music, popular music, and so on. For each country, we will have classical music. For example, Iranian classical music, Indian classical music, Chinese classical music, Japanese classical music, etc. This division of music that separates European and non-European music <coughs> would be eliminated. Division of research into musicology and ethnomusicology. As I mentioned previously, all musicologists are in fact ethnomusicologists because they study the music of different ethnic groups in different historical periods. Thus, separating ethnomusicology from musicology literally makes no sense. I think it likely that in the future, the word ethno will be excised from musicology as a field of study. Whether a researcher is exploring European or non-European music alike. I would like to add a few final thoughts on the progression of music from Eurocentric field to a more pluralistic perspective. A, in the 21st century, the instruments of non-European cultures should be equally valued alongside, alongside European instruments. B, international orchestras and ensembles that utilize European and non-European instruments alike should be established. This is already occurring with ensembles like the Silk Road Ensemble. C, composers should create new works for such orchestras and ensembles. D, through dialogue and cooperation, some of the basic elements of non-European music cultures, musical cultures, such as intervals, rhythms, forms, etc., should be taught to European, American, Australian, and all musicians who are trained in European uh, conservatory system. Almost a century after the end of colonialism, the dust of Eurocentric thinking still weighs heavily on the musical minds of the people of the world. Removing this dust requires directly and deliberately challenging Eurocentric thinking when it appears. However, this challenge must in no way be hostile or anti-European. Rather, it should be done through friendly discussion and establishment of sincere dialogue. In this way, the European musical culture will find its true place among the other musical cultures of the world, not above them, but alongside them. I just wanted to add that I believe that the place we are right here is a vanguard of what I have, I have said. If you were uh, in the concert last night, you will see that the, the first steps that we've taken actually toward a pluralistic way of thinking and making music is we taking these steps right here. And I'm very happy and, and I really congratulate UCLA to be in it.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Maestro. You know, we were thinking to, you know, uh, start having uh, questions at the end of the lectures, but since we are here, and uh, I think it's the better idea if you guys have any question, you can just ask Maestro and we can have discussion about it. Then we can move on to our dear friend, Herbert. You have any question? I understand. I think univer music is a universal language. And when I uh, we say music is a universal language, we mean that all music are universal. Therefore, uh, this the idea of having a platform that is European, it basically came from Europe too. And the reason it comes is very simple. It's really no one's really fault or anything, is because the Europeans just took over all the world. It's very simple. If Indians would take all over the world, we would be you know, studying Raga and, and Ramtala, and we would be studying history of, of Indian music, not one, history of Indian music, two. That's what we are doing in the, in the music schools. You know, I have taught at Carnegie Mellon for 33 years. And this seminar would be not non-Indo-centric. <laughs> exactly, we would be completely <laughs> the opposite. You know, it's, we, are, we are at the beginning of a very long you know, period. Uh, let me give you uh, something uh, uh, to, uh, to kind of elucidate this. Uh, and I'm gonna use the computer uh, you know, uh, as an analogy. I had a computer many years ago, like 20 years ago a computer which was from a very famous company, which I won't name. We had a lousy platform. You had to update it every day. Every day you have to do update. Update after update after update. Oh my God, it would take like 30 minutes to boot up because, because the platform, the operating system was really lousy. I'm sorry to say that. And you know, the, and then it had so much bugs in it that they had to update, and they had to update, they had to update. Finally, I just I had it, so I just tore that computer out. I went bought another computer from another company, which didn't have that. It had a completely different operating system, and I didn't have that problem. And then, just for your information. 10 years later, that particular company was forced to change the platform and completely actually rechanged 
the planet. We are fundamentally Eurocentric, all of us. I'm not taking myself on. But we do update, and update after update. When women, you know, movement uh, starts, we rush to play some women composers. When Black Lives Matter starts, we rush to play, you know, black, you know, uh, uh, African American composers. We make sure we get an African American conductor conduct to conduct the orchestra of Mozart and Beethoven. And so in other words, we update. But the question that we are asked, we have to ask ourselves, is that enough to update? Or we should change the, the completely change the operating system. I am changing the operating system. I'm just trying myself to remove from this thinking and just uh, start all over again. And think of music as something completely universal. And for me, music is always alive. New music, all music is new music. You know, this thing that we say new music, you know, we have new music. Because this is a European thinking. Oh, this is a music that's so difficult, you cannot understand, we call it new music. No, music is new. All music is new music. When, you, when I listen to Palestrina, it's like written yesterday. When I listen to Gregorian chants, it was, it's like listen every day. Music never dies. Music is always new. And all music is new music. And music is a universal phenomenon. And we have to, we have to take steps to actually create a, a universality of music both in education and also in performance. But again, this is not non-adversarial. I am, I'm, I'm, it's a very peaceful for me. It's, it should be a non-adversarial process. It shouldn't be a just kind of anti-European, anti-white, anti-this, anti-that, no. It is a discourse. It is a discourse. It is a dialogue between people who are starting actually create a dialogue. And through actually a long uh, time, which I don't know, I think it would take 30 years for music really create the universality. <coughs> but it has to start from somewhere. Yeah? I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Is it too? Any other questions? Go ahead. Cultural appropriation, you know, they, there has been a lot of cultural appropriation in the past. You know, Orientalism is actually a, um, a, a type of cultural appropriation. Let me give you a good example. The very famous Fitzgerald, Edward Fitzgerald. Everybody say Edward Fitzgerald, great, you know, translator of Omar Khayyam poetry. Edward Fitzgerald could not uh, speak one word of Persian. How could he translate Omar Khayyam? He appropriated it. He had actually a, somebody who actually a Persian who was his friend and helped him and he never mentioned the Persian guy. And then it becomes Edward Fitzgerald. You know, Edward Fitzgerald appropriated the, mus uh, the poetry of Omar Khayyam. This appropriation has been going on for many years. The fact is, instead of appropriating, we have to study the music. Let me give you another example. An American composer that I don't want to name, it goes for six weeks in an African country. And then he comes up with a music that became very famous, which is all Yoruba. Uh, it's all Yoruba, you know, drumming. Well, did that composer really go to that African country and spend you know, 50 years of his life, like me, 
to study Yoruba music? No. He appropriated. That is a form of Orientalism. We should uh, stop actually doing Orientalism. If we are appropriating music of other cultures, we are Orientalists. If I want to, if I want to use, you know, uh, uh, if I want to use a music that is a Mahler, I have to study Mahler. In fact, let me give you one example. Somebody from Iran sent me a symphony. Now it's a, everybody is in this a f fever of symphony. And the kid, he has taken Mahler first symphony and actually transposed it a whole step up. Uh, exactly Mahler, but it's a whole step up. And so I listened to it, then I, it, and I said, well, this is the beginning of Mahler first. He said, well, I was very much influenced by Mahler. I said, I wrote to him, since when stealing is called influence? He never wrote back to me. It, the other way around is okay. You know, it's, it's true that people like in Iran, they appropriate just without knowing Mahler. They're appropriating the music of Mahler. You want to actually write a music that sounds like Mahler? Uh, study Mahler. You want to sound, you want to, you know, write music that sounds like Indian music? Go study mu Indian music. Uh, spend time. Okay, spend your, I spend the, I have spent 50 years of my life studying European music. So if I write a music that sounds European, I have studied it. I'm not appropriate. In commercial music, you know, ev ev everything is free. You know, you grab from this, you grab. I see that in film music. It's complete. This is a new Orientalism, to my op opinion. It's a new Orientalism because I love film music. There is one composer, you know, in Hollywood, who is a master thief. He he just takes from anything that it just comes, anything that you cannot pay, uh, you know, uh, you cannot pay, and it's free. He is using it. Well, that is that is a form of Orientalism. So it's not you're not going to study that music. Um, you know, you're you're showing a, a scene in you know, one film that is actually, it's in Arizona. But you are hearing actually an Iraqi you know, music singing, but the film is happening in Arizona. What does it have to do with the Iraqi singing? Because you want to do it a little bit kind of exotic. But that's appropriation, okay? But there is, you know, there is no law for appropriation. There is a law, a copyright law. You know, if you are infringing a copyright law, you you know you, they can't sue you. But if you're not infringing a co you know copyright law, and you just grab from anything, that's appropriation. And so, in other words, it, it has you know it, again. I'm not in favor of appropriation. That's not a universalism that you just grab from anything you want. My point is that we have to. We have to create a, a, a system of education that is universal and you're just covering it. There are 195 countries in the world. You know, create, create a you know, education system that covers 195 countries in the world. We can do it. Yes. Thank you, Maestro. Um, I'm sorry, we just No, 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 it's great. We wanted to continue, but it's late in Turkey, yeah, so I'm let's sorry. move on to <laughs> Arabic. Uh, but uh, this was great. You know, I, I, I love this topic, and it's interesting because when we talk about Eurocentric, there are some music in Europe, actually, it's affected by that Eurocentric music, like flamenco music. It's very interesting that I love flamenco music, but they don't give enough credit in even Spain to flamenco music. They don't consider flamenco music as high prestige music because it's not part of that system. So it's not necessarily about the location, but it's that kind of a style, I think. It's not that far. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, my friend Herbert, uh, you can start your okay. talk. I was really enjoying listening to Professor Wade again. Um, I studied with him for four years and it wasn't enough for sure. Yeah. And I'm so glad that our friendship, um, actually our relationship is um, bigger than that. Um, and Shah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys about all this that's like so close to our heart. You know, we, we are very emotional uh, about this as well. We, we think intellectually, but also this is um, something we we have an emotional um, connection to the subject. Exactly. And, and one thing that I have to add, yes. Herbert is actually teaching uh, in Ankara and he's actually practicing this subject himself. So he's dealing with a lot of, you know, <laughs> fight, <laughs> I would <Yes>. say, <laughs> to establish that what we are trying to say. Uh, and he's, uh, so he can tell us a lot about this subject, please. Yeah, I learned that non-Europeaners are more Eurocentric than <laughs> Europeaners. <laughs> that's, that's what I learned mo after moving here. Um, so I, when I was a kid, like I was like from like when I was ten to seventeen, I was at the conservatory in Turkey, in Ankara, and I didn't learn one word regarding Turkish music. Um, you look at the master composers of Turkey; they all they all have. Uh, Turkish music influence, traditional Turkish music influence. They write uh, based on Turkish uh, tradi uh, traditional dances. Uh, um, they have like orchestral versions. Great, gr there is great music um, that's dealing with the traditional music, but m none of those are uh, taught in, in, at the conservatory. So, or I didn't learn anything regarding traditional music of Turkey when I was in Turkey studying at the conservatory. And that was a conservatory that was established by Hindemith. Um, there was Bartok's idea, which would incorporate um, traditional music of Turkey in music education. Um, that would have changed the whole whole scene here. But they went with the Hindemith's um, view on music. It's really unfortunate when we when we look backwards. Um, and then I, I, I moved to the United States when I was 17. I, I did all my bachelor's um, and then master's, artist diploma and doctorate all in the US. Um, and then I moved back to uh, Turkey and everyone is asking me like, the economy is so bad in Turkey right now and politically we are not doing great. Um, so everyone is asking me, like, why did you move back to um, Turkey, also I'm a US citizen, my wife is American, my son was born in the US. Um, even the people at my university cannot believe um, my answer. Um, when I read the university, my, there was a new university that was established here, it's called Ankara Music and Fine Arts University. Um, and in the big mission and uh, vision statement, uh, there, there was a mention of, there was this word that existed in there, uh, pluralistic, inclusive. I saw these words, I said, this is the, this is the place to be. Um, so I ran here. Um, there was a great um, um, Balama uh, player, master, uh, Turkish uh, traditional instrument, practicing instrument. Um, he was the president of the university, but he didn't know what to do. He had this idea. Music should be like we should teach here in a pluralistic way. It should be inclusive. There are all these cultures also in Turkey. We need to reflect on that. But they didn't know what to do. Um, so I was like so happy to be. I, I then I was at the right place at the right time. Um, but then you know, I had also many people that think that they are not Eurocentric. They are incredibly Eurocentric. In you talk to them, they say, uh, yes, uh, we should tr learn traditional music, we should learn also Western music, but then you try to make a like concert, there's, there's, you wouldn't see any uh, traditional music in the program. Like, um, one of the first things I did here, like I met with the dean of um, performing arts school at that time, that dean is gone, um, but the dean, 
so like whatever like, do you do you really believe that there should be degrees for Turkish music? And I'm thinking, I read the mission and vision statement. The president is a folk musician. How come the dean is saying that there shouldn't be degrees for Turkish music? So the first moment we met, it was a dinner. We had a big argument. Thankfully, he still hired me. Uh, but we had an argument about it. Uh, the uh, only reason we could change the curriculum here because I studied in the US. And they thought I wouldn't be interested in Turkish music. So they trusted me uh, with the curriculum when we were planning the curriculum. And they didn't think I would be interested in the traditional music of Turkey at all, since I studied in the US. Um, anyway, that's my story about like how I moved to Turkey. Um, for education, of, um, like after moving here, we planned the, uh, the composer's um, composition department's curriculum, also the other department's curriculums, but I will, I'd like to speak more about the composition, composer's uh, curriculum here. You know, in, in the West, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, expression, they are so valued. Um, we, all, we all agree, especially in the United States. That's fantastic. But you go, you go in a school, you want to become a composer, you want to express yourself, they say, you need to use these, uh, these rules to be able to uh, express yourself, otherwise we don't accept you. So you need to study counterpoint, you, start, you need to study harmony. Of course, we, need to, we should study everything. Knowledge cannot harm us. But when we learn that as the, um, the main tool to compose, then that's where problems happen. Um, in Turkey, you need to, in the conservatory system, you need to study harmony for five years. What harmony are we talking about? Like starting from Palestrina to, I don't know, like barely you can get to Wagner. Um, but, so that gives us a, a problem. Does it mean Turkish music has no harmony? Or Indian music has no harmony? Everything has harmony. Just the principles are different. Um, the perspective on harmony is different but we don't learn any of that. We learn certain number of composers' harmony principles. But I'm a 20, 21st century musician. What do we do with that? Okay, let's learn to understand what happened in the past and let's learn the masters. But it has nothing to do with um, what we are composing today. Um, but more importantly, it's, I think, against freedom of speech, freedom of expression and all that. Um, because if we are if we are if we are learning that we can only express ourselves in this language, then there is freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Um, I believe that uh, before we are composers, you know, we all became composers because we love music. We love listening to music. Our first relationship with music is as a listener. Um, in, in, um, I see that with so many composers these days that there's a big disconnect with what people listen to and what people compose. The same person, they listen a um, certain type of music, uh, I don't know, uh, from certain geography, but when they compose, they have to be someone else. And you know, for composers, honesty is so important. Who you are is so important. Your identity, uh, your musical identity, I'm not talking about racial identity, your musical identity, what do you like to listen to, then that should be um, shown in your own music. Like if a person loves Michael Jackson or or who's, whoever is popular these days, or James Brown, let's go more back. And if that person loves James Brown, listens 24-7 James Brown and, and or that kind of music, and if we don't see that in their own writing, I think there's a big disconnect with that person's musical taste and what they what they create. I'm not saying that it should be an imitation, um, but to me it's so weird. I have I, we have students, um, and I'm dealing with this problem. Um, I know they listen to Turkish folk music, um, but they come and they try to do twelve tone um, oboe piano piece. To me, that's also another type of cultural appropriation because. They want to exist in, in academia. They think this is the way to do. Um, many people uh, submit applications to our department. 
they're writing music in D major, major minor. They can, but they think to be accepted in, a, in the academia, they need to write Western music. Um, so we are, we are dealing with the, the problem. So when we think about com a composer's musical taste, um, and you know, here in academia, uh, if the curriculums don't help them understand um, the music they they like, they enjoy, you know, it's I, I believe it's so important that the education is based on uh, the student's interest instead of making it like a factory. A conservatory system is like that. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages, but big disadvantages that it's like a factory. You need to have uh, 30 people graduate, and they all have to be uh, similar. But I think in a modern setting, uh, students should be able to um, choose how they would like to grow. Maybe we can give like basic education, but they should uh, grow based on their interests. Um, and I know it's it might require like insane amount of budget to be able to access and teach um, whole world's music. But I think we should we can do our best. Um, like thinking about um, the budget of the school, the maybe physical space and like personal like network, and try to uh, help them learn music from other cultures and other um, and all the genres. I don't want to say other cultures, like cultures around the world. I should say. Um, so it should be more inclusive instead of. Uh, instead of like having a factory factory setting in a music school, um, one one disadvantage we saw from Western music education is the performer and composer division. You know, you need to be you, you get a degree in performance, you get a degree in, com in composition, but when we look at the past, everyone was a composer performer. All these composers were sweating on stage. It's not, if not stage, in a living room setting, uh, playing music. So um, these days there are so many composers that have no idea about um, like performing. And you know, composers should feel the responsibility of performing in their shoulders and should express themselves. I think that um, the th considering the degrees, like the, the whole university system, you know, we cannot get a doctorate in two fields. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if that's possible. Um, but that made a big division. So in, in our school, we are trying to uh, combine that as much as possible. And you know, in, in Turkish music, in people in, in Turkish music field, they, they play instruments, they compose, they, they can improvise. I think it's important that the musicians evolve slowly and they can improvise, they can uh, compose. Um, and with that, we also, um, uh, created a, um, an ensemble that's mixed and that's performing musical uh, music that's composed and um, and music that was written in the last 50 years. But the main focus is to uh, perform what's written. You know, I was in in wonderful schools in US and I had great friends. But a composer, which is, which is a composer's most important part of their education. I believe is getting their music performed, but that's up to the that's left up to the composers, composition students. They go beg, beg performers. But in, I I believe in in the right system there should be a music ensemble, and that's devoting um, themselves to performing new music, new in in quotes of course. Um, when we look look in the back, all the re the reason why. Um, Haydn, Mozart, those people were alive because their music was performed uh, all the time, and that needs to happen to composers of our time as well. Um, also, I would like to mention the Euro Eurocentrism in Turkish music. Um, so, when Turkish musicians study um, Western music, they started studying from the 1700s, so they, they learned basic tonal music. And with the 
uh, terms that was used in uh, describing tonal music, like tonic, dominant, those types of words uh, were taken from tonal music to describe some terms um, in makam music theory, uh, Turkish music theory. Um, you will see in Turkey uh, there are um, Turkish because Ottoman, Ottoman music choirs, folk music choirs, large choirs that don't exist in the tradition, but they wanted to imitate what, what happened in the West. Um, one scholar called those zombies, zombie ensembles, because they, they don't exist, it's dead, um, you lose all the interesting um, individuality of the regions, everything, you lose everything and you make a big choir like in, in Western music. And there's a big interest in making large Turkish music ensembles. Uh, again, you lose all the identity of the regions. Um, there's a big um, there's a big dilemma in Turkey uh, for the last 100 years, and there's a big division um, between Turkey. They call these I don't believe in these terms Turkish monophonic music, Turkish polyphonic music. I would like to uh, and Shah, please um, stop me when I need to stop. Sure. I'll try to speed up. Let's see if I can do this. One second. So, um, if you look at the notation up here, that's for a folk song. Uh, so if you see this notation, you would call this music monophonic, right? Because it's just like one voice at a time, as simple as that. Um, it's a wonderful folk song from Kütahya. Uh, so right now in the R school, in addition to all the curriculum, um, like our education, like our, our um, value on education, also there's, there's importance in research. Because if you have to teach Turkish music with this notation, this will make no sense. Turkish music is monophonic. But if you listen to recordings, this is from a master and more recent notation of it. You see there are, there are chords. There's so much detail in, in here. Um, I would like to play uh, one uh, one folk song for you, and then I'll show you the notation that was uh, that was written. Could yeah, be yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so if you look at the music, you cannot tell what instruments uh, there are. You cannot see any of the layers. You cannot see the wooden spoons. You cannot see the um, drums. Nothing. Um, so, in order to call this music monophonic, you should be deaf to the percussion. I hear the percussion in here. I see the percussion. How come they are not valued? Um, I hear. Um, the usage of open open strings, um, like holding drums, um, when the when the singer comes, how come those things are not important? There's there's harmony in this, and these are all master master performers. Um, when they get to a climax, there's a there's a clash. Da da da. When they get to the um, the highest note, there's there's beating because because of their intonation. These are great performers. If they thought that this would be something bothering, or if this would be low quality, like to not match the pitch, then they would work on it and they would match the pitch. They they have like 500 uh, melodies in their memory. Um, they can play everything. Um, if they wanted to fix that pitch, they, they could fix the pitch. But there's a there's an aesthetic 
um, there's, um, there's um, a certain principle here. There's harmony principle. That's that's okay with them. More than okay. That's good for them. When you get to the climax, um, you and there's there's beating. They could have fixed it. They they don't fix it because that's part of the um, the musical language of the region. Herbert Chan, can um, we have some so question from you? Uh, sure. One one last thing I would like Go to ahead. say. Um, um, so there are um, there are incredible neighbors uh, next to Turkey, um, from B Bulgaria, um, Greece, Iran, Syria, Armenia. Um, they all have strong. They have language, and they have their own alphabets. Great cultures, and they all influence uh, Turkish music. And when you try to make single theory, single everything, and uh, then you lose all the identity, all the colors. Um, one thing about, you know, we are talking so much about uh, how uh, there shouldn't be a Eurocentrism. I, I give so much value to like teaching Turkish music in Turkey. Many people think that it's because I have nationalistic values. I have zero nationalistic values. It's because I would like this world to be richer. You know, when you want to go out to have dinner, imagine if you would only eat one type of food every night of your life. Um, that would be boring. You know, in, in the United States, you can listen to, you can have Mexican food, you can have uh, Chinese food, anything you would like. Um, why should we be locked into just one kind of music? If you want uh, this world to be richer, I think we should explore and um, learn music of all the cultures as much as um, we can do it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ebert. Thank you. I wanted to give one example I, I observed from uh, Turkey history, and that was when Ataturk came to power. He did many great things for Turkey, but what happened was he actually changed the writing for Turkish people, and they had to do l literally like a transliteration of the uh, word they're using. So imagine what happened, they suddenly lost a lot of knowledge they had in the past. And this was, this idea, Ali Naghi Vaziri, who was one of the greatest Iranian musicians, he actually wrote a paper about this and he was proposing that we have to do the same thing exactly. So I wanted to say how these things drastically overnight changed and even we are not aware of it sometimes, you know, we are just, working and composing, educating our kids without knowing these things happen. So that's why it's important to go back and see what happened over the past, let's say, 100 years. And then maybe we can come back and fix things. Uh, I'm not sure if I would, sure. Uh, sure, um, you pointed out so something really important. Um, now we can read Ataturk's um, letters, Ataturk's conversations with uh, Saigon, who was the most important composer of the time. Um, actually, Atat Ataturk um, wanted to do more folk music research, more research on uh, Turkish music, Turkish culture. But at the, at the time, like, people like him were not understood well. And it's still continuing. People, they think they are following Ataturk. Uh, they think that that means we should be Eurocentric. But right. Atatürk, Atatürk really didn't say that. Atatürk said, let's do research on Turkish music, Turkish culture, because uh, the, the identity was completely lost. Um, and it was drowning in um, Islam idea. Right. So he wanted to do research on um, the Turkish music. But at the, at the end of his life, like in 1936 to 1938, that's when the, the music school was established. And he was very sick. I believe he didn't pay much attention. But he was a folk music lover. He would sing folk songs, and they were collected. Um, but he was misunderstood. And to, uh, to this day, I'm still fighting with people that think they they uh, they follow Ataturk's values, but but they are completely Eurocentric. Right. There was that that problem that erased that caused so much so many problems. We have. And it 
it's very tricky because as soon as we talk about something, some particular subject, they label you as, you know, you're nationalistic or something like that, but it's not the case. Anyways, thank you so much. Any question from Herbert? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear very, very well. I can hear your voice very well, but... Yeah, I because he's I'm sorry, I couldn't he hear. was asking as a composer who had a Western uh, background and he played piano, how he can actually fuse uh, these things. What is the solution for him to get to know this kind of music and then compose based on those component and elements? Uh, you know, my instrument is piano. I, I say unfortunately in many cases, but in some cases it's fortunate. Uh, you know, because it's like completely in European system uh, tu tuning. Um, if you, so I deal with this problem all the time. Um, not all, not all uh, Turkish music has uh, commas, um, um, like mic microtone. Um, uh, microtonal steps um, so I try to use that and also you know we can play we can play harmony but many times like Turkish folk songs um, you see are harmonized using western music but uh, with our research and with the notations transcriptions of the masters you can see that there's there's harmony like certain type of harmony um, in Turkish traditional music as well so when I when I write for piano, I still try to um, follow those principles instead of uh, following Western harmony principles. I go with um, like how traditional instruments are tuned. Uh, tuned. Um, I try to find harmony using those principles. Um, there there are so many great uh, piano works by Turkish composers. Some are very bad, but there are some uh, great ones. I would recommend that you check. Saigon's uh, piano works. Um, he understood this problem and he found his original uh, solution to it. Saigon, S A Y G U N. Please. Um, I want to say just a few words because I've been doing this for many years. And, you know, I, it, one part of my career, I primarily did do nothing but writing folk music, you know, pieces based on folk music. And so, um, but at the beginning, I <coughs> there was several different approach I did. Um, for example, I have pieces that just folk music, it's very simple folk song, is set against a background, a piano, and the piano is completely atonal. So it's kind of a collage. You know, they're just clashing against each other. The first piece that I wrote called Four Persian Folk Song was like this. And I was just, I, I was just surprised how popular that piece became. And that actually get me to write more music. What do you mean the piano is The piano is playing, the, the piano, what piano is playing has nothing to do with the folk song. It's oh, completely right. different. Like, how did you think about it? Yeah. Oh. I simply put them as if, like in the visual arts, you see like two different objects that have nothing to do with each other. They're just put on top of each other. It's called collage. Oh. And the technique called collage technique. And I used a lot of collage technique. The other way that I did was find a way, because music really, uh, by the way, folk music is the most international music. There's not a single music in the globe, in the entire earth that you will find that does not have a relation to another music. That Europe, that actually 
includes your vehicle. And you know, uh, and composers have used a lot of folk music. You know, a study Marlin, a study Brahms. You know, they all use folk music, and then you 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 see the folk music in the music, and so and then you will see that that if you're writing a folk music, that you're writing it has some kind of connection. So I use some of those. In my recent works, I have moved completely away from. And I'm, I went to what um, what Herbert was saying because I realized that basically that's an Orientalist approach to folk music. I'm I'm using European system with equal temperament, you know, European instrumentation, and then on top of that is the folk song. I'm not I'm not alone, you know. Many many composers have done that. Bartok, you name it, Rila Lobos, you know. Finestera, you know, uh, uh, anyway, Carlos Chavez, you name it, every composer that, you know, from 20th century, they have done that. Saigon, Saigon is a great example, a great uh, Turkish composer, Saigon. So uh, what we did is basically this composer, and I count myself at some period of my life, is that we the, fund the foundation is really Euro European. And we, are, we put the folk song on top of the, the elements of the folk song, whatever you, you want to call it, the folk music. Now I don't do that. I just moved away from that. Remember what I said with Sandy, change the platform? Mm -hmm. I changed the platform. In my music, everything in the music comes from the folk music. The harmony, the melody, everything, because this has, this is has it. Well, it's not European, so what? And there is mm, folk music everywhere. In yeah. fact, we are mm, setting a program for next year. We have American composers that are focusing on, you know, American folk music. So I would say, you know, just uh, even ma Maestro, he grew up playing Western music and he was st studying Western classical music. But at some point he realized he wants to do that and he started studying Persian music uh, again uh, from a different direction. So you have to be nerd <laughs> in that sense to yeah, study yeah. Uh, or you know uh, just research more about it and uh, like s this kind of seminars, things like that, that can help to yeah. educate ourselves. Yeah, experience it. Experience the folk music. Get into it. Organic. Be become, a, become a folk musician. Mm -hmm. Even if you're playing piano, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not just, you know, the folk musician, they're, they're doing a lot of things that we call now extended technique. That's something, you know, again, European modernists, you know, uh, made up. Ex entire music of world is extended technique. They're doing a lot of sounds like, <coughs> You know, there is, there are, you know, you see from the Tibetan singers to, to the Turkmen's, they are doing incredible things with their voice. They're doing incredible things with their instruments. Mm -hmm. Just go and learn, be part of this. Yeah, I think see? the problem I, I encountered with a lot of the folks that we synchronize, and yeah. they, like put it and notate it in a way they almost need it. Maybe the solution you is know? not notating. That's the thing. That's what we are trying to understand ourselves too. You know, sometimes yeah. you just have to have a different approach because as we, we were mentioning, we have problem with notation and I wrote it uh, in my uh, yeah. paper as well. Yeah. Uh, you just have to get in the habit of listening it a lot and maybe start performing it yourself first. Then maybe you have solution to transcribe it in a way that you understand it better in your own way. Look, let me, let me give you one example. I wrote a piece called, um, I just, uh, it's called Hajiani. You can go on online and see it. It's for Karna. Karna is a big Persian oboe and electronics. And when I was writing it, it was, I wanted, um, I wanted to do that because it actually original 
the origin is for bagpipe, and the guy plays bagpipe, and plays a mode called Hajiani in from South Southern Iran. And I wanted to do, like, it is the first bagpipe player coming, another one comes eight seconds uh, later, and I wanted somebody on the stage be eight seconds, so we get a three-part con, the two-part canon going. So foolishly, I started transcribing the bagpipe player. It took me a year and a half to transcribe five minutes of the piece. It is so complex, unbelievably complex in terms of rhythm. I mean, you learn a great deal, but I'm, I just wrote a piece for a Turkish Shamshal player, and I didn't do that. I said, well, look, you know what? Let, let the video go. You know, they, the Shamshal player is playing, and I'm actually playing. I, I tell the flute player to play over what he's playing, but taking, you know, the elements of what he's playing in the, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't transcribe this thing. Did you learn what the piece you transcribed? I was the second piece was mine. Uh, Eight Foot Ten? Yes. Yeah. With the ostinato pattern? Yeah. Yes, yes. first violin? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you write the first violin melody? Or yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that was all written? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, should, should we move yeah, on? We, we should move on. Um, I think we don't have much time. I have to extremely summarize my <laughs> um, paper, but I think we can do this. Um, I, my, uh, since we have some historic background about our uh, topic, I wanted to my paper is a little technical and I think it's the basic thing in music that we have to talk about is the concept of time and rhythm. And rhythm is something uh, I think in Iran, I wanted to discuss about a particular genre in Persian classical music called Awazi music, which we have the similar music in Turkey and other uh, cultures around other regions uh, uh, around Iran. So I want you to listen to this little excerpt. And is it coming? No. Again. So, Arash is Persian, and you said you're playing, you play Ne as well, right? I play Persian. Very good. So you're familiar with this kind of style. But I wanted to ask you guys who doesn't have a background knowing this kind of music, what do you think about the rhythm of this? Oh, great. <laughs> what is your name? Benjamin. Benjamin, great. So if you have it in your blood. <laughs> no, but uh, why don't you tell me a little about the rhythm, in the, uh, uh, the form, the style. What do you think about it? I don't know. I was how is it, you, can you, how is it accessible to you? That's the question. I want you to know, how do you listen to this? Um, is it too far from your uh, expectation, or? Um, I don't know. Well, I'm not Persian, but I, I play a lot of Persian instruments and play mm -hmm. Persian instruments. And you play like a very different kind of tone that I play with it. Right. Than the average player. Right. But um, I don't know. I, I just, I know that I, I don't know. Is it from my biggest takeaway? Is it from maybe different? Is it a different way? 
Exactly. It's like you're in a different zone. You know, that's the thing. It's in European music, we always have this uh, tendency of predicting and knowing where the next beat will be there. Now, there is a music, the other part of the board, and we don't have that concept. And simply this music is uh, driven from <coughs> a word. Persian music is based on Persian rhythm, is based on poetic meter. And in this particular genre, um, everything <coughs> comes from that tradition. So imagine when we speak, when we talk, everything is, you start uh, playing by instrument. So wherever we do it, we have it in contemporary music a lot, with, uh, which you don't like that word for. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you, yeah. Um, but they do this now. And then imagine, we have been doing this organically and naturally. And you have to think about it. This music is so complex that we cannot transcribe it. And if, as he was saying, you know, it took him a year to just do this. But even for that, he was not successful and he was not happy with what he did. And even if you do it, exactly what they do is not the way that they process they do their creative process. So I am thinking we have to find a way to see, to get closer to their creative process to understand the music. So um, this paper will explore the construction and creative process of the rhythm of the Awazi style music. Persia has an incredibly rich artistic heritage with a strength in multiple media, including architecture, calligraphy, waving, metal work, sculpture, painting, music, and poetry. Despite many significant historical shifts due to many invasion and war, some characteristic of Persian art have remained the same, consistently stayed true to the center of concept which shared between these art form. So this is uh, Sheikh Lutfullah Mahd in Isfahan city. And this is another one in Yazd. So As can be seen in these masterpieces of Persian architecture, ornamentation is the element of a structuring, a structure and form. In fact, in many work, ornamentation itself become a way to shape the form around one object at the center. In these work, smaller units have their own center surrounded by ornamentation. Each of these units has a self-contained structure and also offers a response to the large form of entire piece. The use of design pattern to embellish building and object for a static effect is one of the most characteristic features of art and architecture in Persia. In such a tradition, the patterns of ornamentation become both vehicle of continuities and the source of subtle variations on similar themes. The persistence 
of distinct visual categories over a long period may be related to the broader cultural appreciation of normative structure also apparent in Persian literature in which poetic forms or vocabularies of imaginary, imaginary, imagery were repeated with minor variations sometimes for centuries. Similar to architecture and other artistic media, music is influenced by the concept of structuring from ornamentation. After Islamic conquest in 1633 AD, the use of ornamentation, which is influenced mainly by Persian poetic rhythmic in vocal style, become one of the fundamental elements in Persian classical music. Ornamentation not only serve as an embellishment, but also structure the form influences the melodic figure and recognizes the meter. These reformation of rhythm, I call it rhythmic zone, consistently avoid any regularity or pulse and build one of the complex rhythmic texture in Persian classical music known as Avazi vocal style. In, there is several meaning in Avazi. I don't want to take your time for that. So. Let's move on to concept of Awaz. The source of music in the Awazi style mostly come from Radif, the group of pieces that collectively constitute the, prop the repertoire of in Persian classical music. Radif is a collection of many old melodic figures preserved by oral tradition through many generations. Appreciation of Awazi style. The pre-imagination of listener will always influence what the listener can comprehend and perceive from a piece of music. This is even more pronounced if the listener are musicians. As an Iranian composer who studied Western classical composition in abroad, I always been interested in response of non-Persian musician when they hear piece of Persian classical music. What do they perceive? What kind of analysis do they produce? Do they hear everything I hear? How do they value this work? My concern and curiosity about non-Western musician understanding of Persian classical music encouraged me to not only examine this question, but also find a way to define this music. Okay, let's talk about the form a little. The component of Persian from a, in Persian classical music can be discussed in various contents. There are several aspects of this music, including its improvisatory and oral music tradition, um, and its lack of regular structure that makes it difficult to study its form. However, for the purpose of this study, I will discuss and give overview of from in Radif in the and, and the Abazi style. So as you see, we have instrumental music, we have vocal and instrumental music. And so you see we have here uh, in instrumental music, we have Pishtaramad, Ray, Radhi. Pishtaramad is some kind of a, like a, introduction. yeah, introduction. And Ray is very, you know, uh, rhythmic, uh, but Zarbi is very virtuosic with me, basically. The other one is vocal and instrumental. Again, we have Daramad. Daramad is basically, again, introduction. Uh, and we have Awaz, which is, uh, can be confusing because we have three different meaning for Awaz. And Tasnif, which is the song, basically, if somebody sings. And in <laughs> Awaz itself, we have Daramad, and we have development, which he doesn't like it, I know. But I put his suggestion, Gostarej, uh, because development has nothing to do with, uh, you know, development section in Sonora form, for example. And I wrote about this, but uh, somehow it uh, makes sense to have development, but Gostarej is different with me. And we have Oj, which is climax, and then Prud, which is, uh, basically coming to the end of the piece. Um, 
please. Sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they, it's. Yeah, they wanted to you basically. Do they give you overview, prepare you for what they wanted to uh, develop uh, later in the piece? So that. Pish daramad is, I mean, daramad is something like that. Pish daramad is a rhythmic, again, okay. it's, a, it's yeah. instrumental. Um, but it's, I'm saying, this is not, you know, you, you can see, you can go to the performance of the masters, they do completely different. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot, do, uh, it, it's not a uh, rocket, like, form that you can rely on it and say. But this can give you overview about the whole thing. So let's listen to these now. <laughs> is um, about the trans uh, this is basically about the uh, I wanted to talk about the ornamentation first ornamentation is one of the most important aspects and main component of Awazi style I said this earlier in architecture ornamentation was the key to build the form we don't have that kind of concept that much here so uh, for example, in Japan, I think they do this a lot too. So these little things, you know, you, you know, you can rely on it. You can build your composition based on this. For example, you know, we don't have uh, or the, the, the definition of ornamentation is not what we think in Western music. Uh, here, when we say ornamentation, is like embellishment sometimes. But ornamentation is big deal, you know. It actually they're building the music based on that ornamentation. Later, I'm going to talk about it. How important is that? Um, the gravity, uh, the ornamentation is one of the most important aspect uh, and main component of Awazi style. This pool toward one pitch is mostly constructed by ornamentation, and so it's not hyper bold to call the Awazi style an art of ornamentation. From a compositional standpoint, it is important to note that ornamentation in this style is used not to just to embellish melodic subject, but as a subject around which construct rhythmic phrases and sometimes a larger sense um, the form itself. There are two types of ornamentation in Awazi style. The first and most important is tahrid, a practical kind of brutal vibration, but with the melismatic quality, the one that we just heard at the beginning. The other type of ornamentation includes range of different embellishment like tekie, which singer use particular pitches. Tekie is a grace note, normally one step higher than the main note. So let's hear this again. As can be seen, the Santu player imitate what occurs at the end of Tahri, which becomes a subject for performer to repeat manipulate, alter, and expand. One of the most essential elements in this style is repetition of pattern that normally occurs at the end of each tahri. <coughs> in the Awazi style, no two masters perform performances, for example, of one particular gushe are the same. While it may be difficult to distinguish the line between improvisation and wadif material 
in the performance. There are some details that they reveal where the performance has authority to creativity, to creativity explore. The overreaching rules of Awazi style as well as framework that controls the rhythm avoid any regularity in meter or tempo. However, in a broader sense, there are some qualities within irregularity that point uh, cons to consist consistency and uni unity in the rhythm. I'm so tired, sorry. <laughs> it's been three nights <laughs> in a row. With this in mind, I will refer the concept of unknown rhythmic zone. Other than its source and component, the Awazi style has certain rhythmic qualities that in combination make up this rhythmic zone listed here. Uh, rhythmic zone listed here are some of these qualities. Each fragment originate directly from the word and poetic meters. The alternate alteration of the rhythm in each chunk and phrases align closely with rubato style. Silence operate not only divide the chunks, phrases, hemistich, and couplets, but also to serve as an object upon which to build new phrases or material. See, they, the silence is not a gap between two objects. It is something you can build something from that silence. Each hemistich in vocal style and each phrase in instrumental music has a cadenza quality that avoids any metric stability. In instrumental avazi style music, the imitation or variation of tahrir in an instrumental become a transition to reach the next chunk or phrases. Um, I'm gonna move faster. So these are, you know, in. I'm not gonna read this, the entire thing, because we don't have time. So these are some pattern in Persian poet, uh, poetry that basically all the great poets in Iran, they rely on these poetic meters. So that's Mapa'idon, the first one. Fa'udon, Fa'al, short, long, long. Short, long, long. These are pattern, and they have another system for musician. Actually, they rely on it. But I wanted to bring this to show you where this actually originally came from. So I want to give you example now. Uh, this is a, a poem by Ferdowsi. Ke dushman ke dana wa badbeh zedus abal dushman dus danish meku. Short, long, long. Sorry, you cannot see. Ke doshman, ke dana, bo vad be ze du. That simple. So, and then they repeat this over and over. You know, they have their own system. It sometimes can be very complex, but. You know, it gives you an idea how the system works, basically. So I brought this here, put it in six meters, as you see, in five. And then the last measure is on, yeah, in three. Kedoshman, kedana, abobad beh, zedus, short, long, long, short, long, long, short, long, long, short, long, and then the one after. Um, so. Now I have an expert uh, that I think is, yeah. This is poem, this poem is uh, by Hatif Esbani, and this is very famous because I choose this excerpt because we have uh, several singers, they sing this in the same gushe with the same poem, so we can have some comparison. It says, Cheshavad. به چهره زرد من نظری به راز خدا کنی که اگر کنی همه درد من به یکی نظار دوا کنی and I put this in 7a که شود به چهره زرد من نظری به راز خدا کنی که اگر کنی همه درد من به یکی نظار دوا کنی 
the first level. But if you are a good singer, see what they can do with this. So this is a, a like a uh, educational uh, book for teaching Persian uh, Ravi by Mahmoud Karimi. I play this first and see how the educational one is. <laughs> I know Maestro Wally is really he really likes this book and he recommends everyone to uh, learn about this and he's right because the transcription is very good good enough but I still think I sh I cannot process this music this way um, so we move on to another singer singer in her time but she was really committed to the poetic meter she was very committed to uh, the text and the gushe now now we have another singer who is a great Persian master Mr. Shajarian wish I could stop this but I can um, see you you really can can you take this one? Yeah. Do you want one for last time? Yeah. Just no, no. I want just from there. I wanted to read this. Uh, it was okay. Then. Okay. You can't conduct anymore. You can't do anything. About I wanted the purpose for this was I just wanted to show the rhythm, but I showed the pictures. But there's so many things happening there which I uh, didn't include it. So I came up with this way of thinking how I can basically analyze in my own way. So I have this, you know, uh, chart that you can see later, but we have different color, one for syllable, one for tahrir, the other, the orange one is combination of short and long syllable, and the white one is poetic meter, and blue is the rest. So, this was from the first excerpt that we heard from the female singer, as you can see, she's very committed to the poetic meter. Short, short, long, short, long, short, short, long, short, long. And this is a 
the poetic year as uh, I was telling you. So, and this is combination of short and long. I think what makes this style unique is the balance between this and that. So the poetic mirror and the combination of short and long. And you see same text here from Peshajaria. It's the same one. You see how his creativity, creativity and uh, technique takes this same thing to somewhere else. The still is short, short, long, short, long, short, short, long, short, long, but long is this, long is this, and long is this. So he doesn't even follow himself. The proportion is something else for him. So it, you know, the battle, it becomes more interesting here. The thing is, it's act this rhythm somehow is accessible for us. We can follow it, but it's so complex to write it down. Um, and I think because in the back, we have those poetic meter, we have some kind of pre prediction that this is going to happen at some point, but we don't know when. So again, same thing, this is for Parvane. And then here's Shajaria. See what he does with it. Again, Parvane, very committed to it. That doesn't mean she's not a good singer, but it, that was his, her style. But Shajaria was a great singer. That was the problem. <laughs> Again. OK. So. Yeah, let's read this. I think uh, we have to wrap it up. This is kind of conclusion for this paper, but hopefully in the future I have a time to just have two hours to talk about this system and the old thing. Um, the meter hidden in the poetic verse builds the basic structure of this style. The application of tahrir and the prolongation of long syllable are the two main elements that avoid regularity in the poetic mirror. The combination of all these elements construct a comple complex rhythmic zone. The dynamic quality of the rhythm is the result of constant changes in these five divisions. The level of intensity or where these excerpts are placed in the form influence the tempo and all other rhythmic values in each division. Regardless of how a performer alters or prolongs the syllables or change the characteristic of each chunk, there's always a proportional sense of uni unity. And that's the poetic meter in the, in the back of our head, as I was saying. Repetition of each hemistich or uh, portion of each hemistich each hemistich are normally not longer than the initial instance. These elongation are typically incorporate more tahrir as compared with initial instance. The length of the verse responds to the length of the tempo and each section. In fact, the length of the verse is not randomly placed simply to divide the section into two chunks. The verse itself is a chunk and should be considered object that forms a section. Anyways, um, I had I had so many things to say, but this was a uh, beginning for what we are planning to do in the future. So uh, thank you everyone for coming. So if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. We are all here to answer the question now.
wonder how the you know, when you hear that how here it is today is given in traditional it tends to be you know to um, at least one is you know more anti-pluralistic and and incorporates a lot of different uh, instruments and, and techniques and traditions but still um, a lot of the times I can say just from experience that when I that it's that you will have to a lot of times it, you know you have to collaborate um, so for for some kind of I don't know, program or whatever you need uh, compositional material and performance to, to be able to create right. something um, what do you think on I, I'm wondering is there any you know is there maybe in your uh, institution in Ankara or do you know of some kind of way for collaborative participational way where you can have both composers and performers from a variety of traditions coming together and maybe even creating material um, I guess you want to say like well yes you know, or like or from different traditions right. yes and if you want to perform something you either have to sit down and study and compose or to take material and create it a performance so I'm wondering if you have any I just want to say something at, in, at UCLA or any other university. You know, they're proposing the courses for one quarter, and they say it's just 10 classes. Of course, in 10 classes, you can't do much. And they, at the end of the quarter, they have to deliver something, either it's a concert or whatever. So they cannot invest on something deep unless the students are already uh, educated or experienced in that sense. Um, I always, for my own experience, I always make my own thing. So I don't reject their proposal or their system. So from that system, I try to some, you know, propose something that is more personal to me. So, um, and I have been experiencing it, you know, uh, we had concert last night and we do a lot of things that, for example, I come and see, okay, I wanted to write this music, I want to do this, but I have a singer who is trained in Western, Western music, yeah. how can I work with her? So we have to come together at some point to know each other a little better. So what I do, for example, I invite her, I say, hey, Michelle, come. We can see this is the concept. I play a lot of video about the concept of my work. This is what I am trying to do. And it's not going to be perfect, but she kind of understand what's going on. And this is going to be a beginning. So we do this, and then next time when we do another per project she understands better what's going on and I say I was telling her you know we're doing this and if you make mistake don't worry we make something from that mistake you know we do this and they don't understand this at first but little by little oh this is this is could happen and nobody put gun on your head to say you can do this no you can you're allowed to do this and actually from those mistakes, you can create beautiful things in that moment. Uh, that was my own experience, but maybe much sure you can add something to this. Or Erberg. Erberg, do you want to add something? Um, sure. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I, I studied also performance in the US. Um, you know, if a violinist uh, wants to perform Bach, they need to play in Bach style, understand the time the aesthetics of the time. If they want to play Tchaikovsky, they will have a different approach. If they will play for a survivalist calligraphy, they have to have a different approach. I think in nowadays it's really important that performers are very flexible and open-minded so they can uh, get closer to the style of the music. And in the United States, I was always like, 
tried to imitate the traditional instruments. Um, it, it, was, it, it was really hard. I still have to do that when um, completely Western trained musicians are asking for music. But since coming here, um, I feel so much more free um, because there are people that play the traditional instruments and they're incredible at reading. Um, in, our, in our school, um, in the new music ensemble, all the composers and performers, there, there's no such division. Performers are, performance majors are composing, composer, composition majors are uh, performing that way. Um, they are in communication with each other for four hours a week and they play their, each other's music. And that's, that's really helping them a lot to learn how they can express themselves. I think, I think Eber is establishing the first pluralist, pluralist music education in the world. It's, you know, I think, uh, congratulations, Eber. Uh, you don't find this uh, kind of approach, actually, as far as I know, uh, in any universities, at least here in the United States, and not even in Iran or in Turkey. There will be a lot of, um, how should I say, a lot of a struggle and a lot of pushing back because, because fundamentally, let me put this uh, very simple, fundamentally, our music education is Eurocentric. It's not that it's bad when I say that, you know. It's because of a historic fact that Europeans you know, went and took over all the world and they brought their own education and established it around the world. As I said, if Indians would do, you know, if we were in the, in the parallel universe and instead of, your, you know, instead of Britain taking 25% of the earth, it was India. Instead of, you know, Britain occupying India, it would be India occupying, um, you know, uh, Britain. So we would have a completely different, you know, uh, completely different, you know, story. So, so there is one thing is that we just take the fact that this is a historic kind of foundation that we are working. And uh, this is a, by the way, this is a global issue. It's not just just in the United States. It's in Iran. It's in Turkey. Anywhere that. It's in China, it's in, in, in Japan. So how should we deal with this? Okay. Now, give me one billion dollar and I will establish my own <laughs> composition, <laughs> my own <laughs> school of music, okay? Suppose you gave me one billion dollars, said Reza, here, take this one billion dollar and do what you want. Tell us what, how we should do. Here's what I'm gonna do. My school will have 10 powerful computers. It would look like headquarter of Google. And I will have a team of computer programmers, 724, that means 24 hours around the clock, seven days a week. Then I have, there are 195 uh, countries around the world. I will have uh, faculty, 195 faculties. Every computer will actually handle uh, 20 countries, about 19, because we have 195. So, and some of them are similar. Not only they will handle this, but also there will be cross references between these computers. So anybody around the globe, anywhere, that can apply to my school, doesn't matter what they want to play. Want to play sitar? I'm going to connect this to the master in Mumbai. You want to play shakuhachi? I'm going to connect him to the master in Cuba. You want to play cello? I'm going to connect him to the cellist here at UCLA and so on. The computers, they will just do all the connections, all the cross reference, and then auditions are global. That means everybody, 
whoever is applying, they will apply to the master and the master will decide. They will take the, uh, the person. So suppose, the, I mean the, suppose they are accepted, okay? They have to do also a minor. And the minor is, you choose a second, you know, music. And you're, again, you're completely free. Let's say a sitar player wants to do guitar, you know, Spanish guitar. So I'm gonna connect him to a master in Spain or somebody, you know, a great player here in U at UCLA. The Shakuhachi player wants to play traverse flute. You want to connect him to the faculty here, or some, the first flute of Pittsburgh Symphony, whatever, okay? Now, the computers are very powerful. They are AI. They will teach the music to you. AI cannot teach music, but AI can teach music to you. They cannot teach you how to feel Indian music but they can teach you Indian music theory. They will teach the music theory, they will give all the exams, and they will handle 195, because each of them will handle 20 uh, computers, they will reference. When you get a quantum computer, one computer can do that always. And we will get quantum computers, okay? So, in other words, you are ha having uh, musicians that are, that are multilingual. So let's say Joe Smith wants to play cello, Bach, and one like, loves rock and roll. Okay, we'll teach him Bach. We'll teach him cello, classical cello, and we'll teach him rock and roll with a master in rock and roll. I don't know, I go to Nashville and find somebody, okay, who we'll connect him. So, Joe Smith graduates, he can play in the orchestra, he can play in string quartet, but then he can go and jam with all the rock people. Joe Smith's ability, his economic ability is, I have did the calculation, 60% higher than a cellist that is graduating from any a music school in the United States. Why? Because of his diversity. He's speaking many, he's speaking rock and roll, he can play rock and roll. He can play, you know, classical. He can do, so there's a, you have, you're creating musicians that can do many different things, okay? When we are creating musicians that are doing one thing, we are doing what is called overproduction. You know, there are a thousand music schools in the United States alone. If every of them would create, if you do graduate 50,000, we have 50,000, you know, musicians coming into the market. We do not have job, you know, in the orchestras. We do not have, an orchestra has only maybe 50, 100. Well, what are these, what are these like 2,000? bringing 2,000, 3,000 cellists a year into the market. Where do they gonna have jobs? How many string quartets should we have? Because they don't, don't have job in, this, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, symphony orchestra. The, the only thing is, you know, they can do is just play, you know, string quartets, 800 string quartets in the United States, maybe 1,000. In other words, we are dealing with a model that is not working. The reason is because United States fundamentally is not Eurocentric. It's a pluralist society. But our music education is Eurocentric. And there is this dichotomy. And this dichotomy actually uh, translates this to an economic failure this dichotomy between Eurocentric method, platform of teaching, and the reality of the society, which is non-Eurocentric, is pluralistic. 
it creates an economic failure. We are creating musicians that join the huge army of, of, of unemployed. And that cannot actually last. That's why a lot of orchestras are not doing great these days. Okay. That, that cannot last. And eventually, eventually, I promise you, somebody will pick up my model. This will come to 22nd century. That is the model of the 22nd century. That you, you know, you're not, you're not, we, we don't have to teach one music or one type of music. We can teach many type of music. And we do not have to be, you know, okay, we do, we are a stage bit because we are in a, in a century that artificial intelligence becomes so fast growing that you can do, you know, an incredible thing with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence cannot feel. Therefore, musician will never die. Music teachers will never die. Composers will never die. Because you can, you can teach music theory, okay? You can teach the theory of Bach, but you cannot teach how to play Bach. AI can teach the theory of Bach, but AI cannot teach how to play Bach. Therefore, it is not saying, well, okay, well, we're gonna become a matrix. We're not becoming matrix. We're using the technology to create a completely different platform of actually teaching music. And that platform is global, okay? We'll come to the 21st century. We are actually global. We are, ref whatever you do here is reflect all over the world. Therefore, it's time that we actually go back and reevaluate the platform, whatever we are actually teaching music. You know, I'm speaking as a person who have 33 years taught, okay, primarily, you know, European music. For 33 years, I have taught, you know, European music to students. I am not European, and I have experienced this. Okay, I'm talking too much. Thank Sorry. You. No, no, it's no. great. With that <coughs> word. I think this was great. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Professor Wally. Thank you, Thank you Herbert. Thank uh, you. And I, Thank know, you. I, I think it's like 3.30 something <laughs> <laughs> in Turkey. It's 5 o'clock there. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you for staying up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was very nice to meet you.